Hey guys, Viking Reefing here. I've got a very exciting video for you guys today, or at least it's very exciting for me. Um, if you follow me on Instagram, you've probably seen that I've embarked on a new project. Um, that project is keeping obligate corral butterflies in a captive environment. These things have long been considered completely impossible to keep in captivity. Um, if you go online and you read about any obligate corral or butterflies, anyone will tell you like it's not possible. They only eat corals. They can't be fed with anything else. Stay away. They have a 100% mortality rate within a few weeks time. And that has been the general view of the hobby for the longest time. Myself, I've been fascinated by these guys for almost two decades. Uh, when I got into the hobby, um, I think it's about 23 years ago or something, um, these things were actually relatively common imports um, and they never lived. Uh, luckily, the hobby is self-policing, so since these things didn't live in people's tanks, people stopped buying them. Um, the collectors, they avoided them like the plague. So you basically never see any opulent corals or butterflies in the trade, at least not here in Sweden that I know of. And as most people know, I do like a challenge. And since I did have good success with opulent coralivores with my orange spotted filefish, I kind of worked up the nerve to try these things. Um, and I feel that now, after a couple of decades in this hobby, I'm knowledgeable enough and skilled enough to actually give it a go. Looking back at the video, I feel that I didn't manage to really get the message across just on how demanding these fish are. Um, so just keep that in mind uh, when you watch the video. Uh, these things are simply not for novice or intermediate aquarists. These are probably one of the most advanced types of fish that you can ever try and keep in a reef tank. Um, it's not impossible to do so, but it's definitely exceptionally challenging. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, I've been in reefing for 23 years and it's now that I have enough confidence to have a decent shot at keeping things, these things alive. So please, if you want to follow in my footsteps or Matt Peterson's footsteps in trying to keep these things, please make sure that you are ready for the commitment uh, that they will require. Like you've seen in previous videos, I basically consider no fish difficult to keep. And these things are no exception. These are extremely easy fish to keep. What makes them difficult is the way we, or at least I, am trying to keep them uh, by not feeding them corals. Let's say that Adam Sandler and Paul Reef would throw in a couple of uh, coral or butterflies in his tank. They would be fine. I mean, they have tons of acros to snack on all day long. That's not difficult whatsoever. However, keeping them in captivity and relying on prepared foods as a main source of nutrition for them, that's what's extremely, extremely challenging to do. Because they basically don't recognize anything but corals as food. I never really buy into the uh, dogma uh, that you read online about fish and whatnot. Um, I feel that the hobby is terribly misinformed in most cases. Um, people basically just regurgitate false information that they've read somewhere, um, not even necessarily that person that actually wrote it had any actual experience with these things. Um, if it's um, copper band butterflies, if it's Achilles tanks, if it's Moorish idols, uh, people will tell you that they're impossible to keep. Uh, those kinds of falsehoods just tends to be um, repeated over and over again in the hobby until it's accepted truth. Well. When I started looking into these things, um, first thing I did was to look in, is there any actual success stories uh, regarding these things? 
And uh, yes, there is actually. So they are not impossible to keep. There have been several instances where hobbyists, and particularly in Asia, have been able to keep opulent corel or butterflies for years and years and years in their tanks and just thriving on a captive diet. Um, Matt Peterson has a very good talk on this subject. Um, so if you just search for obligate corel or butterflies, and I believe it's Macna, you can find that talk. Um, big thanks to Matt. He was a great resource when I started getting into this project and uh, a wealth of information. So there is actual evidence that it can work. Um, there is also a narrative about these things eating corals. Uh, same thing with the orange spotted filefish, for example. And corals somehow contain some sort of magic nutrition which uh, they can't get from anywhere else. So I figured, hmm, if that's the truth, um, let's see the stomach contents of this, these fish. Uh, there are actual scientific papers that delve into the stomach contents of several obligate corals or butterflies. And what you generally find with these butterflies is that the stomach content is somewhere between 92 and 96 percent corals and the rest makes up like worms, algae, uh, copepods, a couple of other things. Okay so obviously they eat a lot of coral. What I then did was that I looked at facultive corallivores. Um, such as the similar artists or Adonis butterflies. So when you analyze their stomach contents, it amounts to about 90% corals and about 10% of other stuff. So not a huge difference. And similar of artists and butterflies obviously do great on captive diets. So I think we can debunk that myth that they need corals to survive just strict from a strict nutritional standpoint. There is nothing really super special in corals that they need to survive. So with uh, armed with these two facts, I figured, hey, let's give it a go. So what I did was that I contacted my local fish store. The owner is a great guy and he really helps me out when I want to get like hard to find stuff or rare fish or whatever. And I told him that I want these things straight from the ocean, straight from the exporters. I don't want them to have to go through the supply chain because they probably won't get fed or at least not uh, fed with foods I would actually accept. So uh, so let's say that the they go the normal route. So they're caught somewhere um, in the say, Pacific. They are put in a holding facility and then they're transferred through like two or three more hands before they reach my LFS. Well, these things are like hummingbirds. They need to constantly be feeding and they will just take too much damage throughout the supply chain. So I wanted them straight from the ocean. So basically that they catch the fish, they hold it for a day or two and they ship it off to Sweden. Uh, what I ordered from him was I wanted one Malaptris, I wanted one Trifasciatus and one Myri. I got two out of three. So I got the Malaptris and I got the Trifasciatus. They're called Ketodonis. Uh, that's the family name, by the way. So Ketodonis Malaptris or Ketodonis Trifasciatus or Ketodonis Myri. And I picked them up a couple of days after they arrived at his place. Uh, I would have liked to pick them up basically straight from the bag, but I have work to do, so I wasn't able to uh, make any time for closing. Um, so I picked them up over the weekend. And my plan to get these things to acclimatize to a uh, captive environment was basically the same thing I did with my orange spotted filefish. So firstly, I transferred them over to my uh, quarantine tank, uh, which is basically just another reef tank. Um, but it's mainly for observation and uh, conditioning of new arrivals. Uh, it has live rock, it has mac macroalgae, and tons of copepods and stuff like that. And in there, new arrivals can chill out and just get used to uh, a ca captive environment without any competition from other fish. 
The only difference between that tank and a standard reef tank is that I keep it on a slightly lower salinity because when you get new fish they generally, at least in my case, arrive somewhere between 0 0.020 to 0 0.022, somewhere around that. So I don't really want a lengthy fermentation process for new arrivals, so I basically just try to match the salinity so I can temperature acclimate them and just dump them straight in. Obviously, the first thing I tried was I just chucked in a bunch of uh, different frozen foods and see if they would, uh, by some miracle, go for it. And obviously, and not surprisingly, they didn't. They didn't even react to anything. The next step uh, was that I tried to smear some mastic on the uh, live rock in the quarantine tank and hoped that they would uh, find that appealing and pick at it. Again, no dice. They didn't even look at it. So then I basically did what I did with my orange barbed filefish. I took some frags from my main tank, uh, Acroporus, and I shucked them into the tank. And both of the butterflies went for the corals straight away and started pecking at them. So that was reassuring. Uh, it meant that they still had a food drive. They weren't uh, so banged up from the shipping process that they would be impossible to get feeding. And once they had stripped most of the tissue from those small frags, what I then did was that I took some mastic and smeared it onto the coral skeletons. And as you can see here, I actually got a feeding response. Um, in the video, the Malaptris is feeding off a um, dead piece of uh, torch coral, which I got from my LFS, um, and it's feeding on mastic. That was the first thing I got them to feed on. So when I saw that, I was like, okay, we're on to something here. So then I made a um, homemade gelatin concoction. Um, basically got some gelatin, uh, boiled that up. I ground in some pellets, uh, some uh, mashed in some mices in there as well, uh, some flake foods and some other stuff. And just mixed it all up uh, until it had sort of a nasty paste. Uh, what I then did was that I cooled some coral skeletons and just dripped that thing over the skeletons, which makes it harden up real quickly. Um, so then you basically have coral skeletons with a bunch of, um, well, prepared foods smeared all over them, so they kind of look like corals. That worked relatively well, I'd say. I did get some uh, decent amounts of feeding responses from them. Uh, they sure did peck at it, um, but they weren't really all that crazy about it. But I could make sure that I actually got some food into them, which bought me some extra time. The thing that actually helped the most was that I used some clams on a half shell. So I bought some uh, clams from the supermarket, I cracked them open, shucked them in, and they went for them hard uh, after uh, a couple of tries. So then I actually had them feeding well enough that I knew that I could sustain them on that diet for some time. But my goal with this is to keep them in my big tank. And I can't really have fish only feeding on clams on the half shell in my big tank, because if I throw one of them in there, for example, my big Imperator, he will eat that thing in a second or two almost. He'll just suck up the entire clam in one go. Um, which won't leave much for the poor butterflies. So I really had to get them on to other stuff as well, mainly pellets and of course frozen foods. But getting them onto pellets will be key to be able to keep them with uh, active feeders, because just frozen foods, I can only feed frozen foods in the mornings and perhaps in the evenings as well. Uh, feeding these guys two times a day isn't nearly enough. They need a constant supply of food and that's where a auto feeder comes in. Here we go. As you can see, that's an obligate coralivore feeding on prepared foods. It 
just look at this. This makes me so freaking happy to see. You might be wondering, why am I only seeing the trifasciatus here? Well, I'm sad to say that I've actually lost the Malapterus. It's not due to starvation whatsoever. Uh, that was actually the better feeder of the two. Um, that one accepted uh, things like angel formula. Uh, it ate pellets, uh, so at least some pellets um, sometimes. And did start to pick on mice as well. Well, the problem with the Melaptrus was that once I received it, I noticed that it had some sort of a abrasion on uh, one of the sides. I, I'll try and see if I can find a uh, video of it here. I'll put it up on the screen. That thing progressed and got worse and worse, so it ended up having quite a large wound on its side. Uh, at first, I was worried that it was uh, uranema. So I did a bunch of formalin baths and uh, other stuff to it as well to see if I could uh, remedy the situation. But after a while, I realized that it wasn't uranema. It just looked like some sort of like a bacterial infection or something. And uh, the wound was actually starting to look better uh, for a time there. So it actually looked quite good for a while, and the external parts of the wound seemed to be healing. Um, but all of a sudden, it got worse again, and uh, it started feeding less and less and less. It was barely lethargic. And today, when I got home from a uh, night away, I found it uh, in very poor health. Um, so I didn't want to look at that anymore. Um, I put it out of its misery. Uh, what I did was I did a uh, necropsy on it uh, to try and figure out what the heck was going on with this thing. And what it looked like was that it was actually some sort of an internal infection. Um, my best guess is that when they caught it, uh, they had some issues with its uh, swim bladder. So one of the collectors tried to um, alleviate the... Um, gas pressure probably with a needle and kind of did it uh, in a clumsy way which caused internal damage on it very sad to see um it's so freaking annoying because that thing was doing awesome but um but even though it was feeding and doing well unfortunately for me the poor guy's uh, probably like immune system finally got overrun and uh he just couldn't uh, take it anymore. So, extremely disappointing, but what's promising and gives me hope was that it, it didn't starve. Um, it actually was feeding very well, it was gaining weight, so feeding wasn't the issue whatsoever. My initial plan was to keep these guys uh, in my observation tank for say a month or so, that's how long I figured it would take for them to start accepting more prepared foods. Uh, but I quickly realized that the amount of food I had to chuck at them to have a remote chance of them accepting anything uh, meant that I really fouled the water quickly. Even though I did have Ketamorphan there and it's a 200 liter tank, um, the water quality kind of degraded rapidly. Uh, so what I then did was that I made a isolation box out of some acrylic and uh, some jump guard netting and I put uh, that thing in my big tank. I'll throw up a video of it right here. Um, a, a bunch of people asked me on how I made it and uh, you guys don't have to nag. I'll make a separate video about how to actually make one of these things because I need to make another one or I need to make a new one because I did screw up a couple of measurements on the old one. Um, so I'll definitely try and do a more refined version two of this thing. And that was basically just to give me the opportunity to just chuck tons of food at these fish uh, for a long time daily, basically. Um, because I have about 1,600 liters of water volume in my entire system that I can handle heavy feeding. And I do feed this to my big tank a lot. So what I did was I basically just dumped in somewhere between 
eight and ten cubes of different frozen food, foods into their section and then it just flew out uh, into the surrounding tank so if they didn't eat something the rest of the fish would uh, eat that but the problem was that <laughs> even though the isolation box looks pretty decent with the amount of time i figured i'd probably have to keep them in that thing I didn't really want that thing in my big tank. Uh, it started to grate on me uh, the, the look of it. Um, I think it's a great option and a, uh, probably the best option, honestly, if you're introducing new fish and you want to do reduce aggression and keep them there for a week or so. Um, but I then did something which could be seen as very risky. I transferred them over into this tank. Uh, this is my LPS and Softy tank. And yeah, uh, it was definitely a risky move. However, I've kept facultative uh, corallivores uh, with porch corals, with uh, gonies, with uh, rock flower anemones, and things like that in the past without issues. I figured these things really shouldn't be too much different. Uh, I did have some uh, micromules in this tank as well which I removed and put them in my sump for now uh, because I'm completely convinced that they would devour those things. And I'm happy to report there's been zero issues. Um, they haven't been uh, picking on any of the corals in here except a couple of acros I did have in here for the orange spotted filefish. They did certainly pick on those. And since I only had a couple of small ones in here, they did uh, quite a lot of damage on those. Um, I figured that if I would keep them in my big tank with a lot of acros, the, the damage would be spread out over multiple colonies and probably wouldn't be an issue long term. But in here, they definitely did major damage to a couple of small frags. So you can apparently say that obligate corallivores are relatively reef safe in a tank such as this. And honestly, I think this is basically the perfect tank to keep these things in. Uh, there's hardly any competition. I do have a small to mini tank, but apart from that, there is dragonets, there's pipefish, um, and a couple of small gobies. So nothing will bother the uh, butterflies in here. And they and they did acclimate beautifully to the setup. One thing I have noticed though is that there are they are a bit more reclusive in this setup, where when there's not a lot of fish swimming out in the open spaces. So I'll try to fix that. Uh, and add some Avanciantias probably and uh, a couple of other stuff in here as well. I plan to keep the Trifasiatus in here for as long as it takes for it to start accepting pellets. Um, since there, there's no point in putting it in my big tank without it accepting pellets um, for two reasons. Uh, firstly, it will be outcompeted uh, for food uh, once I'm just feeding frozen and it won't get enough food throughout the day. Um, the uh, effect of that will probably be that it will be doing a lot of damage to my acros. So as long as it's not accepting pellets, it will stay in here. And like I told you, I did lose the Malaptras, which is so freaking sad and it pisses me off that it did so well and it died for such a freaking stupid reason. Ah! Um, so. I do plan on uh, getting some more coral or butterfly fish, uh, since I can obviously get them feeding and do, doing well. You can just look at the Trifasciatus here, picking away. Um, so what I'm thinking is another Melapterus, not freaking damaged this time. Um, I did see the damage at my LFS as well. Um, it was just a little spot on its side and um, normally if I was just like browsing um, a fish store I would never pick that fish up but this was a special order for me and there's basically no one else you can sell it to and it's it's quite an expensive fish as well so I didn't really want to just leave him with it um, I don't think that's uh, too kind so that's why I picked that up um, so a new Malaptras um, I would also like a Larvatus, um, I think they look terribly graceful, and a Myri. Those are so freaking cool. So with this video, I think we can uh, safely disprove the dogma that these obligate corallivores are impossible to keep. I've seen several threads on, for example, Reef to Reef, where people go off on about 
they are completely impossible. Uh, you can't keep these fish, uh, which is um, just plain wrong. You can definitely keep these fish. Uh, the uh, Trifasciatus in here is doing awesome. Um, and if it dies, it's not because it's uh, completely impossible to keep, it's because I screwed something up. It doing as well as it is, I'm suspecting years at this point uh, with this thing in my care. But take everything I've said with a grain of salt because this is still very early days and this is kind of trailblazing stuff. I mean, there's no handbook on how to uh, keep these things. There are no guide rails. Um, there's very little information, so I'm kind of making it up as I go along. Um, but I hope to be able to shed some information and help the uh, hobby to get more understanding about these beautiful and unique fish. I hope you found the uh, subject matter interesting. Um, if you have any questions or you think I've skipped something or forgot to mention something, please post your questions down below. Um, I will try to get to each and every comment that you guys post. Liking this video is more effective than uh, high pH for good coral health and growth, so make sure to do that. Thank you guys so much for watching. Be safe, happy reefing, and have a good one. Bye!